So I'm normally a glass half full person, but probably like a lot of you over the last year, I've been waking up in the morning and dreading looking at my cell phone. Um, this is com it's sort of a combination of dread and hopelessness that sort of descends on me, and I try to avoid that moment as long as possible. I'm a photographer. I've worked with uh, some incredibly talented photographers around the world. And I thought that despite the feelings a lot of us are having right now about what's happening in our country, I thought it would be kind of interesting to actually look back over the last 100 years at all the progress America has made fighting against injustice and towards this idea of um, all of us being treated equal, all of us having an equal opportunity. So um, I spent a fascinating year looking through hundreds of archives around the world, working with some of the world's best photographers, looking at these amazingly inspiring struggles of Jews, of women, of Muslims, African Americans, Latino Americans, the disabled community, the Native American community. And what I was looking for was this trajectory, this idea that each of these groups has learned from the other group. And it's also to help us look at today and put sort of today in 30,000 foot perspective. It was an incredible pleasure to look through so many of these pictures. And one of my biggest worries is that somehow, this would be a depressing story. Looking back at the history of any country, there's always dark chapters, and certainly America's had its share of dark chapters. And what I wanted to say is, if you ask someone today who is a woman or Jewish or Native American or African American, would you rather be in 1918 or 2018? The answer is always definitely today, which is by no means means that these problems are solved. But we've made amazing progress, and sometimes we don't take that for granted. Um, it's hard to believe that women were only given the right to vote less than 100 years ago. Really extraordinary, in that if you got uh, pregnant, it was, if you had an abortion, it was actually, you could be jailed for that. My, when my mother uh, was pregnant with me, she was not allowed to work for two years afterwards. She had to get a note from her doctor giving her permission to go back to work. When Martin Luther King marched in Selma, one of the things that was so inspiring was that he was joined by people of all different races, of all different groups, all different religions, who were supporting this idea that all Americans should have the same right to be treated equally. One of the most inspiring things happened the day after Donald Trump was elected last year. It feels like it's much longer than last year. <laughs> which is that um, the year before, in 2016, 800 women said they were gonna run for office in the United States. This year, 30,000 women are running for office. It says 11,000 there, but since we did the book, the number has grown dramatically. <laughs> my hope is that, you know, as again, as a glass half full person, my hope is what we're seeing here is the immune system. It's the antibodies kicking in. It's people saying, this is not the America that we all grew up believing in, and, and that, you know, I'm not political at all. I have to admit that I, in some ways, feel like I was responsible for Donald Trump being elected because I didn't take the time to vote. I didn't think my vote counted. I didn't really think my, one vote out of 300 million people is gonna make a difference. My wife's always the one that reads all the details and votes for both of us. Right now, what we need to do is make sure that every single person who didn't vote actually signs up and registers to vote this year. When, when the... Uh, when the protests against the Dakota Pipeline took place, another example of people coming together, 300 different Native American tribes, the largest gathering in American history, 300 different Native American groups came together, supported by t thousands of US veterans, not Native American veterans, soldiers who felt again that the rights of Native Americans were being uh, mistreated, that, that people were being, uh, not that their uh, traditions were not being honored. Obviously the impact of cultural things like Hamilton, the fact that we have people of all different races playing the founding fathers is really incredibly significant. Until 1974, in some states, there were things called the ugly laws. If you were disabled, if you had a disability, if your physical appearance made other people feel uncomfortable, you could be fined, arrested, or put away out of sight. Last year, 4.1 billion people watched the Paralympic Games. These are remarkable accomplishments. I have friends who are disabled who didn't even know about this. This is amazing, this is 1974, this is not that long ago. Um, when same-sex marriage was finally legal in all 50 states, 123,000 couples uh, were married. This idea of being able to love who you want to love, like what a novel idea. Um, and these are the rights that I think so many Americans now feel are, that we're on the verge, I think a lot of us felt that so many of these 
accomplishment, so many of these battles have been fought, were set in stone, that the wind was at our back, that we're moving in the right direction. And I think a lot of us feel today like this progress is so fragile. There's so many things that we thought were set in stone that are no longer set in stone. There's good news here. Um, a picture like this would have been unimaginable a few years ago. On the left, you have a Muslim American with his daughter on his shoulders, and on the right, you have a, a Jewish American with his son on his shoulders, working together, fighting against Trump's first uh, airport ban. I believe this picture is actually taken here in Chicago, which is pretty amazing. Now, the idea of how prejudice and hatred is passed on from one generation to the next is, um, it's, you know, it's us talking to our children, right? It's what we stand for. It's the little things we do or the little things we don't do. It's standing by when we see somebody that's being mistreated and not stepping in and intervening. Um, to me, this picture of this Ku Klux Klan grandmother kissing her granddaughter is totally chilling. This idea of how hatred is passed on from one generation to the next. Again, back to the Dakota Pipeline, extraordinary picture of police that were brought in because the, the media wasn't paying attention and they were experimenting on the protesters who were totally peaceful. This is an, an amazing quote by Brian Stevenson, who just launched the Lynching Museum in Alabama about three or four weeks ago. You know, I believe that most people that go into the police force are doing it for the right reason. I think most cops are good. I think the police are there to protect us. What I don't understand is why the police circle around and protect the bad cops. I think it drags all, everyone down. You see these statistics over and over again. Six police charged for abuse. You know, the camera never lies except when a police officer is involved, and then suddenly that doesn't mean anything. Six policemen charged, there's a mistrial, and the judge acquits all the police. And you see this over and over again. And then you wonder why people in, in uh, African Americans, and all of us are so frustrated at this fact that, that the law is being enforced um, indiscriminately and unfairly. One of my favorite pictures from the Black Lives Matter of movement. This is what, like that picture of the guy stopping the tank in Tiananmen Square, which is one of the most amazing pictures in, in history, I think. I'm a technology nerd, and so um, in this book, this Good Fight book, there's 63 pictures where you can point your smartphone at different pictures in the book, and it plays TED Talks, it plays uh, music that represents the struggles of many different groups. And I just want to show you one short video, which is one of the most touching. Do you remember what was going through your head when you first saw me? I remember when the doctor pulled you out. The first thing I thought was that he was being too rough with you. And he actually held you like a little Sprite bottle. And he was like, here's your baby. That was the most proud moment of my life. Don't tell your brothers, because it's three of y'all. But it was like looking at a blank canvas and just imagining what you want the painting to look like at the end, but also knowing you can't control the paint strokes. You know, the fear was just, I gotta bring up a black boy in Mississippi, which is a tough place to bring up kids, period. But there are statistics that say black boys born after the year 2002 have a one in three chance of going to prison. And all three of my sons were born after the year 2002. So dad, why do you take me to protest so much? <laughs> I think I take you for a bunch of reasons. One is that I want you to see what it looks like when people come together, but also that you understand that it's not just about people that are familiar to you, but it's about everybody. Did you know the work that Martin Luther King was doing was for everybody and it wasn't just for black people? Yes, I understand that. Yeah, and so that's how you got to think. If you decide that you want to be a cab driver, then you got to be the most impactful cab driver that you can possibly be. Are you proud of me? Of course. You my man. I, I just love everything about you, period. The thing I love about you, you never give up on me. That's one of the things I will always remember about my dad. Uh, you said it like I'm on the way out of here, or like I'm already ready to go. So there's three and a half hours. Uh, I love that video. There's three and a half hours of video that are tied to images in the book, which is fantastic. That's from StoryCorps, by the way. Uh, the animation is by Steven Spielberg. It's a fantastic clip. 
We look at many different groups, as you saw at the beginning of, of my presentation. This is 1970. This is how women were presented uh, 50 years ago. Just unbelievable, right? I mean, it's funny, but it's also so disturbing. We have infographics in the book that look at um, the, the role of women, uh, it, basically from the early 1900s to today, how many PhDs there were, what age uh, women got married, their rights in society. You can spend like three hours exploring this document. Um, a young woman who was being bullied at school created this wonderful sort of visual graphic, which I've always loved. We talk about the role of the disabled in American society. Um, I'm going through quickly through these pictures because I love every one of them. It's like, which of your children make it into the lifeboat in terms of what to share with you today? <laughs> these are all backpacks of immigrants coming across the Sonoran Desert. 25,000 people have died trying to get to America to, because they were afraid, because they were trying to protect their families. Um, these were uh, migrants along the side of a highway. And what you don't hear about is that immigrants right now in America are sending $70 billion a year back to their relatives. This is one of the largest acts of, human, of generosity in human history. And it's certainly not the way that, that their story is being portrayed you know, by our government right now. First, a, a Latino American astronaut, which I love. The difficulty of trying to tell the stories of so many groups in just like 258 pages, was, it was just so, many cha so challenging. We went through, uh, I think, 27 different versions of the book. The night before, Native, before elections, um, the African-American community experienced uh, the Ku Klux Klan driving through their neighborhood with nooses. There's music throughout the book as well. Uh, this is the uh, um, Strange Fruit by Billie Holiday. We use media, we, talk, we basically show how the media has changed the way that people respond to, um, uh, you know, sort of how the, how the media has both reinforced the stereotypes and how they've uh, gotten us to change our views of groups and people that are different from us. And then finally, um, when there was um, a cemetery that was desecrated, Jewish cemetery, uh, the Muslim community put together a fundraising page. And when a mosque was burnt down two years ago, the Jewish community opened up their temple and invited the Muslim community to come in and worship. These are stories that are not being told by the media from day to day. 50,000 children visit the Holocaust Museum in Washington every day. I hope that the kids at Parkland, in Parkland, in Florida, who have started this incredible movement to get other kids their age, Right now, a lot of people feel like the government's not going to save us. There's no Superman or super, Superwoman that's going to fly in and rescue us. Every one of us needs to do a book or march or call your congressman or donate money. But we can't sit by and hope that someone else is going to solve these problems. We need to do it ourselves. My dream, my hope right now, is to find a way of putting this book into every high school in America. Because I think it's the age of the Parkland kids and my son Jesse who's here. These are the kids I hope they're going to take the mantle and, and bring America back and get us back on the path that a lot of us grew, grew up believing in. So thank you very much.